Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to start by thanking you all for being here, and thanks to CPI and Clayman and CEPR as well. Um, it's a real honor to be here with these incredible colleagues presenting work on gender inequality. So as we've seen from the presentations that have come before, there are many different mechanisms that drive gender inequality. One of those mechanisms is discrimination, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So when we think about discrimination by gender, we know that it occurs across different institutional domains. So we see it in education, we see it in the healthcare system, we see it in consumer markets, as well as other institutional context. Today, I'm gonna to focus specifically on gender discrimination in employment. And I'm gonna focus on employment because we know that work is a key institution that helps to keep people out of poverty, and it's through the institution of work that we often see gender inequality in earnings emerge. And specifically, I'm gonna focus on gender discrimination in hiring. This is important because hiring is an early and key step in the employment process. And also, as social scientists, we've developed a set of really strong methods to identify discrimination at the hiring interface. So I think it's important, before we move forward, to think a little bit about how we're going to define discrimination or how I'm going to be thinking about discrimination in the talk today. So I'm going to define gender discrimination as the differential treatment of a person or a group due to their gender. Um, and this focus is on behaviors, which is really important here. I'm thinking about treatment, not necessarily attitudes, beliefs, or ideologies. Certainly, those factors are important in understanding gender inequality, but my emphasis is really going to be on behavior. And so as a concrete example, we can take this. Imagine that a woman has equal or even superior skills, educational credentials, and ability compared to a man. They both apply for the same job, and the man gets hired. This is an example of gender discrimination. If we see this emerge across organizational contexts and time and space, we have strong evidence that gender discrimination is at play. Before moving forward, I want to mention that my talk today is really going to focus on issues of gender discrimination. I'm not going to talk much about race and ethnicity in this context, but if you have questions during the Q&A, I'd be happy to talk about racial discrimination in hiring as well. Okay, so as sociologists, as social scientists, we spend a lot of time thinking about measurement, right? When we want to understand gender discrimination, we really have to think about how we're going to measure these concepts. And as you can imagine, discrimination and measuring it is difficult. And it's difficult for two primary reasons. First, it's difficult to observe. Oftentimes, as researchers, we're not present at the moment of hiring, and we don't have full information about what the context of the hiring decision looked like. Second, discrimination is often really difficult to detect. Men and women who are applying for jobs often vary in many different ways other than just their gender, and thus it can become difficult to make claims about the male and the female applicant being equal on everything except their gender, right? So they may differ in educational background, they may differ on work experience, and rarely do we get cases where there's an exact comparison between a male and a female applicant. So to address this challenge, social scientists have come up with a bunch of techniques that help us really measure and understand discrimination. One of these techniques is what we refer to as audit studies, uh, which is a branch of kind of larger field experiments. In this type of work, we send matched pairs of nearly identical fictitious job applications to apply for real job openings. We then randomly assign the resumes a gender, often using gendered names. So for a female application, we may use Michelle. For a male application, we may use Michael. But everything else about the applications is nearly identical. We then track employers' responses to each application, which we generally refer to as a callback. And then in this context, because everything else besides the name at the top of the resume has been held constant, we can infer from differences in callback rates that discrimination is at play. And so this approach allows us to deal with the two key challenges that I mentioned around, first, the challenges with observing discrimination, and secondly, the challenges with detecting discrimination. So what I'm going to do now is present some evidence from a set of studies that have, incorporated, that have looked for gender discrimination and how gender discrimination plays out in intersection with other categories. I'll present some other scholars' work as well as some of my own. Um, and all of these studies use that kind of audit study framework in one form or another that, I'm, that I just referred to. Um, and they all signal gender using the names at the top of the applications. 
So the first study I'm going to present is from Shelley Carell, Stephen Bernard, and In Pike. Uh, so it was a foundational study looking at how gender intersects with parental status in shaping employment outcomes or hiring outcomes. Again, they manipulated the names of the, uh, they manipulated the gender using names on the applications, and parental status was signaled through involvement with the Parent Teacher Association. On the y-axis here, we have the callback rate. And on the x-axis, I'll present the callback rates for the different conditions, so gender and its intersection with parental status. So what we can see here for men is that it looks like fathers received a slightly higher callback rate than non-fathers in the study. Um, there's actually no statistically significant difference here. And so the key takeaway is that parental status for men doesn't seem to be a huge driver in their likelihood of getting a callback for a job. However, we see something very different when we look at the case for women. We see strong motherhood penalties emerging, with childless women receiving callback 6.6% of the time compared to 3.1% of, of the time for mothers. In a complementary study using lab experimental data, Carell and her colleagues show that this motherhood penalty emerges for a couple of reasons, including the fact that individuals have real concerns about mothers' levels of commitment to the employment process and to work, and that these commitment concerns are really important in understanding why the motherhood penalty emerges. And we're going to see this theme around commitment emerge in other studies as well. The second study I want to discuss is another audit study by Lauren Rivera and Andras Tilsik. And here, the scholars were really interested in thinking about how gender intersects with social class background in shaping hiring outcomes. And here, they're focused on the elite legal labor market. So all of these applications were submitted for legal jobs. And what we see is that, or for men, uh, and men and women, they signaled gender using the names at the top of the resumes. And they signaled higher class status through, largely through extracurricular activities on the resumes, so things like being involved with polo, or sailing, or listening to classical music. Okay? And what we see here is actually quite shocking, that for men, the returns to higher class signals in the legal labor market are very high. So the callback rate for men with higher class signals is about 16% compared to 1% for men with lower class signals. However, things look very different for women. Uh, we actually see no, no positive returns for higher class signals for women with higher class backgrounds. And indeed, women with higher class backgrounds only received callbacks 4% of the time, roughly, compared to 16% for higher class men. So we see a large gender disparity emerging here. The next study I want to present is from some of my own scholarship, where I was really interested in thinking about how gender intersects with different types of employment histories to produce outcomes uh, for workers at the hiring interface. And here, again, I manipulated gender using names. And then I manipulated, I manipulated applicants' employment histories. So some applicants received a full-time, standard, seamless employment history. Another set of applicants were assigned one year of part-time work before they applied for a new job. And another group of applicants were assigned a year of unemployment or a gap on their resume. And so what we can see here is that for men with seamless, full-time, continuous employment histories, they're called back 10.4% of the time. However, if they've had a part-time job for a year, the callback rate drops down to 4.8%, so a strong negative penalty. And a year of unemployment, the callback rate is 4.2%. And so for men, we see that part-time work looks a lot like unemployment. For women, things look quite differently. We see that for women with full-time employment histories, they're called back 10.4% of the time. Compared to women with part-time histories, we're called back 10.9% of the time. So then there's no statistically significant difference here. Um, it looks like there's a slight drop in the callback rate for women who were unemployed, but it's not statistically significant. And so what we see here is these strong penalties for men for moving into part-time jobs, which are heavily feminized in the United States, uh, whereas for women, we don't see the same sorts of penalties. In a complementary survey experiment, I show that some of the penalty for men for part-time work accrues to them because they're seen as less committed to their careers and less dedicated to work and employment. So again, this theme around commitment emerges in this context as well. The last study I want to discuss is from uh, some of Jill Yavorsky's scholarship. And here, she's really interested in thinking about how the context of evaluation shifts the way that gender discrimination emerges. And so here, she's thinking about three types of contextual forces. The first is the status of the job. So is it a professional job or a working class job? The second is the gender composition of the job. So what proportion of incumbents in the job are male or female? And then the gender typing of the job. So 
she measures gender typing by coding the language of the job postings to either be highly feminized language or highly masculine language. And what she finds in the field experiment is that women experience severe discrimination when applying for male-dominated jobs, particularly when those male-dominated jobs are working class. And men experience severe discrimination when they're applying for female-dominated jobs across the occupational spectrum, so those that are both working class as well as professional jobs. So what are some of the key takeaways from this set of audit study research and the body of research that's emerged on hiring discrimination by gender? The first is we see that the effects of gender on hiring discrimination are complex and they're heterogeneous. They intersect with other social characteristics like parental status, class background, and employment history in really important ways. And also the context in which the evaluation is happening plays a key role in shaping how gender discrimination emerges. Second, we see that issues of commitment and concerns around commitment and dedication to work are key drivers of gender discrimination and the way that gender shapes hiring outcomes. And finally, it appears as if violations of gender norms are important in shaping gender discrimination. So men moving into part-time jobs, women applying for male-dominated working class jobs, men applying for female-dominated jobs, these sorts of gender deviances appear to produce gender discrimination as well. So where do we go from here? I think there are a few key next steps. First, I think it's important to pay continued and additional attention to mechanisms. So thinking about how issues of commitment, as I mentioned, but also competence concerns, as well as fit and other dynamics serve as key mechanisms linking gender with hiring outcomes. I think it's also important to pay continued and additional attention to variation. So how might the policy and the legal environment within which individuals are making these decisions shape gender discrimination? Also organizational demography. So when we have more women in leadership positions, might that make the hiring interface more friendly towards women? Thinking about organizational policy and practice. So when we have more highly formalized uh, hiring practices, might that weed out some of the gender discrimination that we see? And ultimately, I think it's important uh, to set up to, uh, new testing and development of new ideas for interventions within organizations where we can try to reduce discrimination not just in hiring, but also at other parts of the employment process, such as wage setting, promotions, as well as terminations. Um, and so hopefully, moving forward, we can begin to take these things into account to figure out how to produce a more equitable workplace for women. Thank you. <laughs>